the educational system is really the gateway to prison. The gateway to prison often starts with getting into trouble at school, even as early as kindergarten. Some way, somehow, it, I feel like it's just always going to happen. That's the thoughts that we have. We discover a unique program in Western Washington designed to keep all students at their desks and out of handcuffs. This is not just a Seattle issue. It is a nation's issue. And our black boys and teens deserve better. It's called the school to prison pipeline. Kids, mostly kids of color, are funneled out of the classrooms and into courtrooms. Thanks for joining us tonight. I'm Joyce Taylor, and this is Facing Race. Tonight, we're looking at the educational system and what teachers and really all of us can do to give kids a fair shake. Let's start with a snapshot of students in the classroom here in Washington. More than half of the desks from kindergarten to 12th grade 52% are filled with white students. Just over 4% are black. That means black students make up a very small percentage of their classes. But they are the ones teachers and administrators here in Washington are expelling or suspending at a higher rate. 8.3% of the black student population will be disciplined. Native students aren't far behind. While they only make up 1.3% of the student population, 7.7% of them will be suspended or expelled. Compare that to 3.4% of white students. Those same students kicked out of school often end up in jail, and that has been a problem for generations. But as Tony Black shows us, Seattle Public Schools may have found a solution. School wasn't something that you know, was invested into me, so I wasn't invested in it. Deshaun Neighbors of South Seattle says his journey through the public school system wasn't easy. It's not something that I looked forward to going to every day. School was tough, not because of the homework, test, or even earning his diploma. He did that in 2012. It was tough because from his first days of school, he felt alone. Few in a position of power looked like him, teachers or administrators. I don't remember having like a super close relationship with like any teacher like that. Would you have wanted one? Uh, it, it probably would have benefited me for sure. Uh, but I didn't know if that was what I wanted because it wasn't something that I thought was benefiting. You know, I didn't see it wasn't happening. Deshaun Neighbor's story isn't unique. According to the ACLU, black students are suspended or expelled three times more than white students. And there's a huge consequence. For those kicked out of school, they're three times more likely to end up in the criminal justice system. It's a phrase you've probably heard before, the school to prison pipeline. Why has this been happening for decades? Studies show black males systemically have the cards stacked against them. They're disciplined far more often than white students and they're labeled as troublemakers. And when they do get in trouble, there's few black mentors in the building for them to lean on for help. You feel like you're always targeted anyway, whether you're in the wrong or the right, you feel like there's just no way that you're not gonna cross paths with the law. Do students of color and black boys in particular have an equal shot of success in the classroom? Today, the answer would be no. Dr. Mia Williams is executive director of Seattle Public Schools' new Office of African American Male Achievement, or AAMA, the first of its kind in the state and a pioneer in the country an initiative to remove barriers and give support to African-American boys and young men who, according to district data, are the furthest from educational justice. It is actually a marathon to unpack all the institutional racist practices that have gone on for long that have not benefited our kings in Seattle Public Schools. I noticed that you, that you call them kings. Yes. Tell me about the importance of, of, of calling them. Why, why kings? <laughs> kings, because in our, in our history, um, we were kings, and it, we've tried to strip that away in, by dehumanizing our, our um, black boys and teens. And so we refer to um, our kings as kings, all the black boys as kings, so that they know that they are royalty and that they are brilliant. The AAMA is only a year old, but they've already hit key milestones, such as including black student voices in decision making, hiring black male leadership and AAMA managers, partnering with community resources to remove the most basic barriers to learning, the need for food, 
clothing and housing, supporting the human resources team and hiring more educators of color. In 2019, state education leaders reported nine out of 10 teachers in Washington were white. Deshaun, who now has a one-year-old daughter, says having a resource like the AAMA while he was in school would have been a life changer. The ability to connect with educators who better understand his background. A lot of people are going to school more than they're at home with their families. So it's like, if a, this much of a chunk of my life is being taken and being spent with somebody that has no experience that I can experience, no relations that I have, no type of any connection, it's like, how do I benefit from that? Deshaun is now working as an ambassador for Community Passageways, a Seattle nonprofit dedicated to keeping youth out of jail, stopping black boys from getting stuck in the school to prison pipeline. What they're doing with us, we they're creating just rehabilitation, um, changing the way we think about things, changing our actions. Deshaun knows what they're going through. When he was eight, police pulled him over while riding his bike for not wearing a helmet. At age 14, he allegedly stole from a rent and Safeway and wound up in the back of a patrol car. I wouldn't even say I was really too much phased by it. I was just like, oh, okay, whatever. <laughs> it, it really didn't, it didn't move me too much like it probably would like the average person because, I mean, even if that was my first time being in a police car, I've seen it so much, so it was like, eh, it's inevitable. Winding up in prison as a young man was inevitable. What is your reaction to that, and is his story unusual? What I know is the Office of African American Male Achievement is committed to changing that narrative. It didn't stop there. Last November, he was arrested again, charged with robbing a Bellevue Chipotle where he had worked. He's awaiting trial on electronic home monitoring and is working at Community Passageways to help other kids avoid his path. Do you see versions of yourself in any of the kids that you work with? I do see some, uh, some similarities with some of the young men in the group within myself. You know, a lot of us come from different backgrounds or, you know, different areas, but some of the trauma is really the same. The trauma in school of feeling misunderstood, alone, and labeled. And at home, watching the black men you look up to being taken away, ending up in either jail or dead. Even if you're not physically doing it yet, it's it's embedded in you. It's, it's, it's kind of in your blood, really. It's like, mm. you know, even if you try to your best to get away from everything, you're somehow going to end up, you know, at least next to the trouble. The AAMA is committed to changing those outcomes and creating educational parity for a group of students left behind for far too long. I believe everyone needs to pay attention and show black boys and teens that they matter, that they're brilliant and um, recognize their black excellence and um, help support them with the right resources and tools to be there. So why haven't schools given kids of color the support they need? I asked Sharon Navis, who heads the nonprofit called the Equity and Education Coalition, and she says that our state still hasn't faced the racism that exists here. And she tells us what teachers can do. Do we have equity in Washington schools? Nobody does. There's not a single school district in this country um, that has really tackled equity. Um, you know, for, for us, it, equity means um, looking for the programs that service the students the best, especially those students that are being left behind, the, the students that are arriving at school hungry, coming from an, an unsafe environment that have all these different needs, but all of these also different assets. Um, and, and we haven't achieved that yet. We haven't really dug into what it would look like for us to be an equitable educational system. I know you're aware uh, Seattle schools are phasing out AP classes to address equity in the classroom. What are your thoughts on that? I think that is a huge disaster. We could work on equity without having to take away advanced placement classes. The advanced placement classes have historically, whether it's Seattle Public Schools or any other public school, they have historically been available to white and um, Asian students. And instead of tackling how we bring students into the advanced placement classes. And instead of tackling getting more students of color uh, into advanced placement classes and offering them the support 
to stay in advanced placement classes and succeed in advanced placement classes, Seattle Public Schools has decided to just get rid of advanced placement classes, um, which sort of is the cutting of your nose to spite your face because it doesn't end the racial injustice issues that are happening in schools. There's also the issue of segregation. Why are Washington schools still so segregated? There's a variety of reasons. We have not yet as a state dealt with the, the racism that we have here in Washington. Um, from things like redlining to gentrification. When we talk about segregation, um, most people don't believe that we have segregation or that we ever did have segregation. Segregated schools tend to be the low-income schools, tend to be schools that are in low-income areas of, of the area. They tend to get the least amount of funding. Morally, what we are telling our children is that they, um, they don't deserve the best that they don't get the best. They get what's left over um, as after we fund white schools, right? And schools in high income areas. I wanna uh, share a statistic. Uh, during the 2018-19 school year, black and Native American students were suspended or expelled at more than twice the rate of white students. Why does this happen? And what is the impact of that? It happens because we have criminalized our educational system for black and brown students. Uh, for black, indigenous, and brown students, we, the, the system, the educational system is really the gateway to prison. The statistics show that black, indigenous, and brown students respectively get pulled over more often, arrested more often. They get disciplined more often for the same offenses as our white counterparts. That really is part of the school to prison pipeline. When we're talking about students that get criminalized for normal everyday occurrences, not offenses, occurrences like wearing their hair in dreadlocks or um, you know, wearing a specific color to schools, those things are criminalizing our very existence. What role does implicit bias play in the classroom? It plays a huge role. There is a study that came out that shows pre, pre-K uh, teachers view their black and brown students much more aggressively. They view them older, they view them more violent. Their behavior is viewed as more problematic. They are able to either suspend or expel, expel uh, kindergartners, pre-kindergartners, first and second graders for behavior that has been normalized in white society and in um, higher income society as five-year-olds being five-year-olds. And that's how it starts. We don't have conversations with our teachers about how their implicit bias against black and brown students comes out in the decisions that they make to either suspend or expel a student. I absolutely think that every teacher needs cultural competency or cultural awareness trainings, or we are hoping our, ch our children will be lifelong learners. We need to expect that of our teachers as well. The most recent data we have uh, from 2018 to 2019, that school year shows 87% of Washington state teachers were white. Yes. What's the impact of that? It's detrimental to not ever see someone in, a, in, in your classroom, at the front of your classroom um, that looks like you. What can white teachers do to address the achievement gap? in the classroom for their students of color. They can become anti-racist. They can do the work. Read about racism in education. Read about the genocide and violence that created this, this, this country. Read about the segregation and the negative impacts of busing. Um, learn how to uh, become a culturally anchored educator. And what are some concrete things that schools or leaders could be doing right now to make schools more equitable? Our school leadership, our state leadership, um, have been very good about talking about equity, um, but they have not necessarily institutionalized equity. Um, and you can see that in the state budget, you can see that in the um, the budgets that have come that are coming out from the school buildings, the school districts, um, this, at the state level, um, you know we need to put money into programs and um, uh, policies that help our students 
uh, and we don't often do that. Coming up, the three words that cost a Tacoma teacher her job. And it silenced me. Two years later, she says now's the time to tell her story. Welcome back. Before the break, you heard our experts say that equity in education needs to start in the classroom. One Tacoma teacher tried to do just that, and it cost her her job. She tells Kristen Ayers her story, one she regrets not sharing sooner. Well, the first time that I wore this shirt was probably in the fall. So that would have been the fall of 2017. At the time, Jessica Pacho was a Spanish teacher at Tacoma's elite private Annie Wright School, with no inkling that one shirt and three words. In fact, it is a statement of solidarity. Would spell the end of her career there. This was my way of showing my students that I'm their ally. A message of inclusivity that she says was clear in her classroom every day, on the posters she kept on the walls. But when Pacho wore the t-shirt twice in her final months at Annie Wright two years ago, the blowback came quickly. I was brought in and the headmaster told me, more or less, that my shirt was political. He told me I was being insubordinate and it, it really tore me up to hear that explicitly stated that it was wrong at that school to make a very basic statement about black lives. The most basic statement you can make, that their lives matter, that their humanity matters. Pacho says the school headmaster bullied her into silence. I was threatened with, if you say anything, if you talk about this, if you're political in any way, you will be immediately fired. And so she quietly resigned that year, and Annie Wright banned teachers from wearing clothing with written messaging. For two years, Pacho kept her story to herself. It was strange to me to then see Annie Wright come out in solidarity and post on their Facebook page, Solidarity Black Lives Matter. Annie Wright joined a chorus of other institutions speaking out against systemic racism after George Floyd's killing. But for Pacho, the post rang hollow. I needed to go back, hold myself accountable for what had happened. In a lengthy Facebook post, she told her story for the first time this summer, not just calling out the school. And I've made a lot of mistakes and I want to do better. But calling out herself for staying silent. I feel like I let myself down because I wanted to do more. Pacho has moved on now to a different school where she can wear the t-shirt freely. A teacher still learning the lessons of anti-racism. I know that even a small drop of water makes a ripple. Sometimes you have to be satisfied that you made that small ripple and then go make another one. Annie Wright sent us a statement saying the school has been and remains deeply committed to matters of diversity, equity, and inclusion. Please do not take the fact that we don't comment on personnel matters as an indication that we are not committed to anti-racist work. We are. The school's dress code banning clothing with lettering still stands. To become an anti-racist ally, the first step is education. If you like movies or books, there are a lot of resources out there. And we put together a list. Just text the word GUIDE to 206-448-4545 and we'll send you a link. Well, in this time of COVID, parents are trying to make remote learning work. And let's face it, it's difficult for just about everybody. But for many families of color, especially those who may not speak English, Amity Adrisi shows us it can be downright impossible. We were supposed to be in November of last year, but we had to cancel it due to my grandma passing because of cancer. Then we moved it to April. We had everything planned. COVID-19 put a stop to a significant life event for Maria Guerrero Rivas, her quinceanera. It's a celebration of a little girl becoming a young woman, helping them like take big steps into the future. Maria is growing up quickly. 16 minus 6, 10. Taking on more responsibility than most 15-year-olds. My parents don't speak English. They don't, well, they do, but they, it's just, it gets hard for them. That can create a barrier between a few things, opportunities that I get to have. Her family moved to Vashon Island more than a decade ago. May we have your attention, please? It's only a 20-minute ferry ride from tech-centric Seattle. But here, many families are cut off from internet access. 
Oh, good job. High five. As the daughter of Spanish-speaking parents, Maria helps her younger siblings set up for school, figuring out technology and teaching when her parents cannot. It inspires me in a way to try to help others because I know that not a lot of people have that help. Like, there's people whose children, like, don't speak English, and so they can't tra translate for their parents. Maria is not alone. Thousands of children who live in households where English is the second language are falling into the chasm of what's called the digital divide. Stanford University defines digital divide as the growing gap between the underprivileged members of society who do not have access to computers or the internet. So how big is the digital divide? Well, the data is hard to come by, but a survey conducted by Common Sense Media and the Boston Consulting Group found that nationwide, more than 15 million kids in the U.S. lack adequate internet access or devices needed for home learning. 18% of those students are white, 26% are Latinx, 30% are black, and 35% Native American. Here in Washington state, more than 170,000 students don't have a digital device, and almost 250,000 don't have adequate internet connections. And because of the pandemic, it's estimated that those numbers will spike. Because I think when people think about tech, they think, great, we'll give you a hotspot, we'll give you a computer, you're all set. But there's really all this learning and familiarization that happens that I get lost on. And, you know, if you don't speak the language, it's even harder. Alejandra Trace is one of the co-founders of Comunidad Latina de Vachon, a grassroots Latino advocacy group on Vachon Island. CLV is currently helping more than 70 Latino elementary school students get online every day. That's in addition to tutoring and mentoring. Trace says the pandemic is shining a light on an ongoing problem. That world it already existed with an educational divide for Latino children. And so we're really seeing it open up into a chasm. And what we want to do is look at it as an opportunity of like, how can we be really curious about building something better? Because COVID has changed everything. What if when we come back, we think about keeping some of those changes that actually really improve educational opportunities for Latinos. Alejandra was reluctant to speak on camera alone because she says the core of Comunidad is about respecting and representing the voice of the entire Latino community. Why is it so important for your organization to be Latino-led? Some of our best allies are, are white allies. And for us, it's not just about being Latino, but it's about understanding that, our, that we have the solutions and that we're more than a sum of needs, that we really have talent and ability. And just if we're just given the space, we can only come up with solutions that are great for everyone. 20 minus five. And while Maria waits to celebrate a major milestone, she is not waiting to fight for change, working with Comunidad as a youth leader and mentor. I mean, we've all looked out for each other. We'd be willing to have each other's back helping to build the bridge across the digital divide and fight for what they need. Our families are ingenious and resourceful, but it's just a lot more barriers than many others face. To break down systemic racism is giving back the power to those most impacted. After a break, we'll be answering one of your frequently awkward questions. Now it's time for your Frequently Awkward Questions, the part of our show where our experts answer some of your questions you may be too afraid to ask. From a viewer in South King County, why do youth of color wear hoodies year round? It makes me think they don't want anyone to be able to describe what they look like. I think to myself, that kid's up to no good, and I become watchful of their every action. The answer from Sharon Navas of the Equity and Education Coalition of Washington. I think if you're thinking what is that student, what is that youth up to? That youth is up to no good. It's not the youth, um, it's you. And um, I would think about why that's your first question. Um, because when I see a white youth in a hoodie, it doesn't phase me at all. Um, and and we're, we're socialized to think that some kids can wear hoodies and be okay, whereas other kids wear hoodies and they're up to no good. 
If you have a question for our experts and you want to see it on an upcoming show, text FAQ to 206-448-4545. Next week on Facing Race. It's contamination that you really can't see or smell. Sacred land spoiled. What do you think is the core issue here that allows something like this to happen? Uh, racism. The lasting impact on one area reservation. It's a deadly, toxic slime, and it's stuck on our people. The health effects hitting people of color hardest, and the fight for environmental justice. Thanks for joining us tonight and for sharing your stories. And we do hope you'll join us again next week for Facing Race. From all of us here at King 5, good night.